Okay. Uh, thank you for attending this meeting. Uh, this is the SAA shop safety training meeting. Everyone that will continue working in the shop is required to watch this semester training video or attend the lecture. Um, safety is a very vital importance to our shop. Uh, failure to meet any of these points can mean uh, thousands of dollars worth of fines to our shop. Uh, and as you can imagine, with the monetary situation that we're in some years, that the some fines like this could mean that we may not be able to attend competition, or in a worst case scenario, that it may shut down our program. There's been uh, labs on campus that have received $100,000 worth of fines, and to our organization, a fine that huge could potentially shut down our program for uh, a very long time. For our yeah. program. Yeah, yeah, and, and don't, don't talk exaggerating. Uh, two years ago, our physical plant department on campus, they're the ones who do all the maintenance in the, the buildings and basically take care of the, uh, the campus for us. They were caught using an aerosol spray can of a brake clean outside their, uh, their building. Um, and the, uh, the residue, they were letting you know, fall into the, uh, the soil, and they received a $100,000 fine for that, that single violation. So it's going to be very serious very quickly. So that's why we need to, uh, to all do our part, make sure that you know, we're, uh, we're respecting our, our, uh, our environment here and, um, and enforcing the, uh, the policies that environmental health and safety, uh, the HNS, have, uh, have set up for us you know, to do so. Okay, so with that, we'll start going through the points in this document. Uh, most of them are related to the chemical safety, which includes storage and usage, uh, as well as uh, chemical waste. Uh, both of which are key points that are easy to violate in the shop and we need to make sure we follow these. There's also some points relating to general soft, uh, shop training, equipment use, uh, and those will be later in the document. Uh, we're going to start off with chemical safety. So the first point is all chemical containers must have labels and you should not be using abbreviations on these labels. So any chemical that is brought into the shop must have a clear label on it. If, um, say you're working with resin or Bondo and some of the Bondo falls onto the label and covers up uh, part of the name, you're responsible for either cleaning up that residue or putting a new label on. Without a label on the chemical, uh, someone may not know what it is. While you may know it's Bondo, if there's, say, a fire or a big leak from that bottle, someone may not know how to clean it up properly because it's not clearly labeled. And abbreviations are avoided so that anyone that's dealing with the chemical knows exactly what it is. While you may think an abbreviation is common and it's used every day in the shop, someone outside the shop may not know that abbreviation yet. So it's vital to print the full name on the label. Number two, original certified containers should always be used for storage. If the original container is damaged or unavailable, you must use a container made of an identical material, uh, material composition or, of a, or a steel container. Uh, for an example, using a water jug to uh, store oil is unacceptable. Use what was given or an acceptable replacement or that chemical should not be in the shop, dispose of it properly. Uh, the point's that easy. Who can tell us why that's inappropriate? Like, what's, what's the risk there if we use a plastic water jug for storing oil? Or anybody that's done that? Yes? The oil will eventually corrode the plastic water bottle to the point where it breaks on the bottom. It mm -hmm. still looks structurally sound, and so you notice that all the oil is in the pool below the bottle and not in the bottle. Right. Same exactly. thing happens with fuel and, like, Coke cans and such. So it causes it to become brittle and crack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, third point. Secondary, secondary containment, or, or containment hub, is a safeguard method used to prevent unplanned releases of hazardous chemicals into uncontrolled work areas. All secondary containers must, have, must be labeled to identify the contents inside as well as health risks. So the, important of this, the importance of this is to ensure that there is no chemical spill from the container you're using. So what you'll see in the shop for what we mainly use these for is uh, chemical hazardous waste storage. So as I'll point out later, all hazardous waste must be stored in a secondary containment hub to prevent spills. Likewise, if you're 
pouring a chemical into, uh, say, a bottle, you need to make sure that, that bottle is in some sort of secondary containment hub to prevent it from spilling onto the ground. So we want to try to avoid spills as much as possible. Uh, a spill, say, onto an electrical socket is a bad idea or is an unplanned hazard. Um, say you're pouring it on the table. Obviously, you don't plan to have it go into the socket, but if it spills and then splashes onto the wall, you could potentially have an electrical fire from some sparking that would occur. So for secondary containment, we really have two, uh, two items to supplies to. We have two five-gallon plastic containers. One is labeled to, uh, to hold oil waste, whether it's um, used oil or a brake fluid, so oils and lubricants. And the second one is for uh, basically general solvents. So what, what Bill's talking about here with the secondary containment is that this five-gallon container, this five-gallon bucket that contain, that, that holds the, uh, the waste as we generate it, it just sits inside the secondary container. So if this does burst, break, or rupture, then the, uh, the fluid obviously is going to safely be contained. Um, yeah, so this is going to be uh, maybe a seven or eight-gallon container. They're marked, uh, it's marked yellow right now. So it's clearly really visible in the shop. Mm -hmm. And that secondary container, if you're storing chemicals in it, must be 110% greater by volume than the primary container. Fourth point, MSDS, material safety data sheets, must be readily available for every chemical stored on UF property. This includes the energy park. So if you're bringing a new chemical into the shop or out at the energy park, you must bring an MSDS with it. In fact, uh, we're saying policy that uh, you should bring two as well as an electronic copy. One copy will be stored at the shop, the other will be stored at the energy park. That way, if the chemical is ever brought out to the energy park for storage or usage, that the MSDS is already there. Or likewise, if you're bringing it from the energy park to the shop, we'll have it available. And the electronic copy will be placed on the computer by the shears, just so that's another way of easy access but we always want the hard copy. When EHS does the inspection, they want to see the hard copy because that's always available and a computer can crash at any time, but the hard copy should always be there. If for some reason you see a spill on some of the papers, uh, please notify someone or take the responsibility yourself to print out the new, a new copy of it, which again will be found on all the shop computers. And you may think MSDS are only for hazardous chemicals such as gasoline, acetone. In fact, you can, an MSDS is available for most anything that's brought to the shop. You can find an MSDS for sunblock. Uh, virtually anything has the MSDS. If it's brought into the shop, bring an MSDS with it. Uh, to find an MSDS, it's usually not that hard. All you have to do is search the chemical name and possibly and the brand name as well to find the most the more specific one for the chemical we have and search MSDS with it. A lot of companies have a dedicated spot on their website for where they have the MSDS sheets for their material or there's also some website specifically dedicated to MSDS. So, so th this is a really important point. The, uh, if, if the chemical is not fit for human consumption, basically if you wouldn't eat that normally, feel that you're going to turn out all right in 10 years, um, the, the, the company is required by law to uh, provide the end user MSDS, so they're always available. You just do a quick Google search, you can find it. Um, so even if you go to the, uh, to the store, it's 12 o'clock, uh, you go to Walmart and you come back with super glue. Uh, again, we, we don't always associate chemicals and MSDSs with common items we use around us. So it doesn't matter what it is. Right now, uh, Dylan's taken the, uh, the, the last uh, two or three weeks and he's had some of your help to uh, do the inventory, to, to find MSDS uh, data sheets for, uh, for all of the, the chemicals that we currently have. But if somebody brings something in and we don't have it, then uh, it's binary. Passing this inspection is binary. They just have to find one thing we didn't have the MSDS for. They don't really care to look at all the other you know, 60 chemicals that, that, that we did. So we all have to uh, do our part to, uh, to find the MSDS sheets when we bring something into the shop. Uh, second comment, we all know where the L chemical storage cabinet is. The MSDS sheets, there's a clearly labeled notebook on top of the, uh, the, the cabinet. So if you have to use it, make sure you put it back there so it's always right there with the chemicals. Yes. Okay. 
Number five, an accurate and current inventory must be maintained for all chemicals. So anytime you bring a new chemical in, you're going to have to fill out on an inventory sheet what chemical you brought in, again, no abbreviations, and how much. With that, if you're using a chemical, say some of the um, some lube assembly, and you run out of one bottle and there's still three remaining, please update the sheet corresponding to how much we still have in the shop. When EHS comes by, they want to see an inventory of what we have, so they know uh, if there's, say, potential hazard, they can see how much of the chemicals may be in there to know how to deal with the situation properly. If there's an ounce of uh, one chemical, that may not present a hazard. But if there were, say, a gallon or more of it stored, that's obviously more of a potential risk, especially if it's flammable. So always update the inventory. Now, something such as acetone will commonly have one can in the shop and will replace it when the other one's getting low. So for that, it's not as necessary to cross it off and put zero and then put one later because typically we'll end up having one bottle in the shop at a time. If you feel that we're not going to have that bottle of acetone in there for quite some time, it would be necessary to put that we don't have any of it in the shop or in fact just cross it out completely just so if there is any uh, hazardous situation going on that the people taking care of it know that there is no acetone in there. But it is important to update it uh, when a new bottle is brought in. Any questions so far? Okay, this is meant to be a dialogue, so, so don't feel like you're interrupting us. We want to answer your questions. Something doesn't make sense or first time you're, you're hearing it, which is the case for a lot of us. We haven't, most of the time, worked somewhere where we had to uh, really be concerned with this stuff, so don't hesitate to, uh, to ask questions. Okay, takes us on to rules for uh, chemical storage. Yes. Starting out, we don't want to, uh, to store chemicals above shoulder height. Um, because that presents a, a risk when you are taking taking the, the, uh, the chemicals out of the cabinet. So the example I used last time we had this meeting about a week ago was um, uh, a friend was taking a, a gallon container out of a uh, uh, chemical storage cabinet and it had been in there for so long that the steel, steel can had actually corroded to the point that when she took it off the shelf, the bottom fell out of the container. So obviously if, if it's under you, that's going to fall right on you. So it's rare that we're prepared for that, but you never want to have to back it over shoulder height for, uh, for that reason. Also, it's heavier than you anticipate. Obviously, that's going to allow uh, somebody that's, uh, that's not real strong to, uh, to drop it, and that's going to end up with a you know, with an uncontrolled spill. Um, second point here says don't stack chemicals, and that's something they look for when they come through and do their, uh, their inspections. Okay? And they can do those inspections at any time. So by stacking them, you can have, uh, if a container does break, obviously you're going to have uh, two chemicals that potentially could uh, could combine if the wall if the wall underneath it is not uh, sealed um, completely, and it just makes it harder to um, to to prevent. Um, I guess I should say stacking chemicals makes it easier, you know, to have uh, an uncontrolled spill in the cabinet if something does fall off, because somebody just closes the, the cabinet door when they put something else back. If it's stacked, something else is stacked, it can fall off. Even if it's two small containers of the same chemical. For instance, mother pol uh, Mother's Polish, which is a small container about that size, you're not allowed to stack those. Again, closing the cabinet can cause it to fall off one of each other and knock something else off, or knock something else over, and now we have a game of dominoes going on in the chemical storage cabinet. And that could knock over something that may not be sealed properly or is not meant to be stored on its side at all and that could cause a chemical spill. Okay, next point says chemicals without legible labels can't be stored or disposed of. So that means that anytime we can't read the label, we have to resolve it, we have to fix that. So we need to uh, clearly re-identify what the material is, even if we decide as a team, well we don't need this anymore. You know, we cannot let the h &S come and get it. We can't ask them to dispose of it, and we can't take it somewhere in good conscience and ask them to uh, properly dispose of it if they don't know what it is. So we must label it. Uh, again, Dylan's taking care to make sure that everything does have visible labels, but as users, we, we're the ones that have to, uh, to, to continue to enforce this. We can't have one person coming along like, annually trying to uh, suddenly update us so that we can pass inspection. You know, this, is, uh, this is something that we have to do uh, as daily users of our facility. 
Um, yeah, so we have to do this immediately upon uh, first time that the label is becoming unreadable. C says ensure that the capsule lids are securely tight to prevent leaks and evaporation of contents. That's something that they do when they come by to do their, uh, their inspections. They're going to grab some chemicals. They're going to see if they can pull the, uh, the lids off. They're going to make sure that the, uh, the, 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 the screw-on lids are, are tight on uh, chemicals that are, uh, com that, that are uh, volatile. So uh, we need to uh, make sure that we're putting the lids on uh, mindfully. And that goes for like gallon containers. Uh, if you're using something and you get a bunch of product in the, uh, the groove for the lid, you try and put the lid on, that's going to prevent the, uh, the lid from sealing. So you would need to take a, a rag and remove that, uh, that, that material that's in the groove and make sure that you, you use a hammer and securely um, put the lid on uh, completely so that if it does get knocked over, you're, you're confident that it will seal. D says bottles can't be stored on the floor unless they're placed in secondary containment tubs. So obviously if it's on the floor, somebody can kick it over. So it's not a matter of if it ever happens, it's when it happens. Because again, we have a lot of people using our facility and accidents are going to uh, continue to happen. So if we have a secondary containment tub, that can make sure to, uh, to obviously to contain the chemical so that we can clean it up in a controlled manner. Flammable chemicals in amounts exceeding 10 gallons in one room must be stored in flammable storage cabinets or safety containers. So we have one of these, this applies to us. We have more than 10 gallons of uh, flammable product. Um, so we have, that's why we have our big yellow uh, chemical storage cabinet. 55 gallon drums aren't allowed unless we get to approval by EHNS and we have to jump through some hoops to be able to uh, secure that material um, uh, properly because obviously that's a lot of uh, a product that if, it's, uh, if it is flammable can cause a very serious explosion. Um, so they, they definitely want to uh, um, work with anybody that's using those types of, uh, that, 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 that volume, that quantity of material to, uh, to tell them the additional safety guidelines they need to follow in order to, uh, to mitigate the, uh, the chance of um, having a, causing a very serious accident in a uh, building. This doesn't really apply to us though. Um, in the past, we, we had a 55 gallon drum of brake clean um, in the shop. Yeah, that, uh, it just showed an example of how wasteful we can be too because we went through that in about the same amount of time as we'd go through two or three cases of a brake clean. So it's like a brake clean party. We use it for everything. Um, these gallons over here, there. Now we 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 would be able to to do this. So if you're doing sponsorship and a company wants to give us 55 gallons of uh, product, we would uh, uh, kindly ask if uh, they can give us five or or, or 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 two or three single gallon containers instead. Chemical waste. Gee, chemical waste should be placed at the designated waste accumulation area. Uh, inappropriate rep receptacles, properly labeled and segregated by hazard class. So all this means is that in the shop there's going to be an area for the lab, an area for SAE where there's a sign that says hazardous waste accumulation um, area. And at, at the bottom of that you'll see a uh, steel pan and it'll have uh, containers that are marked. So let's say we use some, uh, whether it's our solvents container or we use something else that you know, it's pretty much we decide we're not going to use this anymore, let's get rid of it safely, properly. So we're going to have it uh, properly labeled, put it over there, and when that, uh, that, that, that area gets um, above the, uh, the accepted level, then we would, uh, we would either call the h to pick it up, or we would take it to an authorized um, uh, recycle center in town. Okay, so, so anything that, is, that needs to be disposed of has to be in that one location by the, uh, the best designated as the waste accumulation site. You can't have just multiple containers uh, around the, uh, the lab, and the, uh, the stuff that's waste shouldn't be stored in the chemical storage cabinet either. It should be out in that, uh, that accumulation area so that it can be uh, disposed of um, you know, in, a, in a timely fashion. Yes, Carl? Does, I mean, does EHNX charge us money if we have them pick it up? Because I know if we take it to a recycling place ourselves, they charge us like 15, 20 bucks, depending on what it is. Well, it depends where, where we go in town. So EHNS won't, um, they, their job is, is, is to help us, so we should never be fearful of uh, the cost to uh, dispose of things properly through the uh, department, the, or through the university. Our department's happy to pick up the, uh, the tab for us okay. doing that. They're happy to see that we're being responsible users, and we actually had some, some waste that we got rid of in, in the right manner. So, a, excellent question. And about uh, twice a year, Gainesville has a hazardous waste uh, material collection um, call where they can where, where they have it set up because they, they know that as like individual users a lot of people if they have stuff in the garage they don't want to pay to, to, to get disposed of so they, they have these set up uh, biannually where they don't charge anything all you have to do is over that weekend take those materials out there and ask that you have them labeled so if we uh, just watch where those dates are that will be for sure an easy and uh, free way for us to dispose of anything that we need to properly 
Uh, eight, chemicals should not be stored indefinitely. If we don't need something, then uh, we'll dispose of it properly. So obviously I'm not saying go in the cabinet if you didn't use it in the last week, get rid of it, right? Because we know we have a lot of users doing different things. But by forming an annual uh, chemical assessment, kind of like when we clean up the, uh, the shop to get ready for the new season, we, uh, we organize, we, we get rid of stuff that is deemed collectively as unnecessary, not usable again in the future, uh, just wasting space. The same thing with, uh, with chemicals. If, if, if we um, uh, realize that we haven't used something in five years, that's probably a good indicator that we can get rid of it and not miss it. The next one says segregate incompatible chemicals. And um, basically this says that there are, actually I'll, I'll let Dylan talk about this one because he knows a little, little more about it. Okay, so to finish what this point says, uh, we segregate the chemicals to prevent um, inadvertent mixing up incompatible chemicals which can produce harmful gases, vapors, heat, fire, and explosions. And there's a table at the end of this document to show segregation by hazardous class. Only it was on one slide. It wasn't on one page. Now that would blew it up. It, it doesn't like it. But but uh, it, it just tells us. Um, it gives us a, a list on the, uh, the paper copies that we'll have in the lab. It's uh, easier to read. If Dylan will uh, quit scrolling for a second. Sorry. It's uh, easy to read. It just tells you uh, if you see it across the uh, the top and, and you see the intersection on the uh, the, the left hand column that those chemicals should not be stored together. Okay, so um, because the, the potential of the mixing might be an exothermic reaction, could create an explosion or other uh, undesirable uh, side effects. Um, for us, this would apply to such things as, let's say, two-part uh, two materials where you, uh, you mix a catalyst or an activator with a, a base product and um, you know, they, they, they give you a, uh, a usable chemical. So we would want to, uh, to purposely store those either in separate, separate cabinets or um, if you want, if you store them in a cabinet, um, this might this seem, might seem odd the first time. Don't correct me if I'm wrong. You want to store them on on the same shelf, but we want to use steel, like almost like a cookie sheet, steel containers that the uh, the items are stored in separately. So if one ruptures, there's no chance of it getting outside this container or dripping down to a lower shelf and reacting with something that uh, that it shouldn't. Right. And if possible, try to use something larger than a cookie tray. I say this because even though a cookie tray can contain the spill, uh, if, say, all the chemicals from that container are leaking out, uh, if there's an unknown hole in it, say the bottom of it corroded and a hole, a hole formed in there, say in both the containers, part A, part B, they could then spill the cookie tray and then react exothermically. Uh, a common example of two chemicals that react exothermically that we have in our shop would be part A and part B for some composites. So ideally we want them separated completely in different uh, cabinets. Uh, with these, uh, you want the hardeners put in the fire cabinet because it has a lower flash point. A lower flash point means it will combust at a lower temperature. So obviously that's more of a concern for us to put in the fire cabinet because that would be the first chemical to ignite. So if you can't uh, separate them in cabinets, just make sure that they're on the same shelf, like, as Mike said, to avoid one chemical dripping down and going onto the other, and that they're in appropriate tubs to contain any spill that may occur. Okay, and that brings us to point seven, which is rules for chemical handling. Yes, yes. Sir. in uh, working with uh, incompatible chemicals, um, avoid bringing any uh, chemicals that have some kind of liquid chlorine as part of the chemical, um, like the uh, brake clean. We always use non-chlorinated brake clean because if you were to use it on something hot, like to uh, clean off an area prior to welding it or something like that. The if it gets hot enough that liquid chlorine becomes chlorine gas, and there's plenty of various stories online of people like doing that same thing, like cleaning something, then going to weld it or going to like work on it. It gets hot, creates chlorine gas, and then they end up in the hospital. So sometimes deathly ill. I would from a single exposure. Say, if you see things like that, I say we need to just avoid all forms of liquid chlorine. 
uh, and I, I feel that like finding chemicals with the segregating chemicals out. Yeah. And, and, and no, nobody is uh, going to be a uh, chemical expert. Well, there might be a chemical engineer in training, a couple hopefully among our, our group. But yet, yeah, uh, we're none of us are a chemical experts. So, you know, assessing how to store things properly and what the uh, specific risks are is something that's uh, well done in a, in a team environment. So, you know, the rest of the team is here. I'm always here to uh, to ask questions too. And if I don't know the answer, I'm not going to uh, to blow smoke. But I'll be able to to find some mitigation as they can advise us you know, appropriately. Okay. So, rules for chemical handling: never use chemicals alone. This is uh, related to. Uh, never use any a mill or lathe alone. The same thing, if something happens to you while using the mill and you get hurt, no one's there to attend you. Uh, something similar can happen as far as, uh, well not, not necessarily similar with injuries, but you can still be injured while using chemicals. So it's easy for, even if you're spraying brake clean uh, and you have safety glasses on, some of the brake clean can splash off the part over your safety glasses and then drip down from, say, your forehead into your eye. Or, or say both eyes, and if that's the case, uh, you may not be able to find where uh, any of the eye washing stations are, so you may be wandering out around through the shop essentially blind, blind and in pain, uh, knocking some of the chemicals over, some parts, creating more of a mess. It's just a bad idea. That's a true story. That, that happened to, to one, of, one of our members. So, um, he was warned about just how, how high a velocity the brake thing come out of the, uh, the can at, and let his guard down. Just needed one, you know, quick squirt is what he said. And uh, yeah, he, he blinded himself. Uh, couldn't keep his eye open. And we hadn't been there to uh, take him outside and uh, run his, his 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 head his eye under the uh, the water for a couple minutes. That may have been a worse injury for him, rather than just an hour of inconvenience. Likewise, if you're ever working under anything that has chemical stored in it, for an example, working underneath our car, always wear safety glasses, even if. You trust our oiling system enough to not leak even a single drop. It may leak a single drop while you're under it. It's happened before in the shop where one time one of our members forgot to put safety glasses on uh, just to go under the car to check something on the exhaust. And some oil ended up dripping off the pan into his eyes. So that one time where he was under the car for a planned 30 seconds, he ended up getting oils, oil in his eye and he wasn't able to see. We had to escort him to one of the eye washing stations. And even after a couple minutes of washing his eyes out thoroughly, which you're all supposed to, you're supposed to do that for 15 minutes to make sure that it's completely flushed out, he was still in pain. It was hard for him to see. So he ended up having to walk to the other side of the shop just to get to the station. Imagine trying to do that by yourself, blind in pain. It's probably not going to happen at least not safely. Okay, the next one is laboratory coats must be worn over personal clothes and exposed skin when uh, basically when, when chemical substances are being used. Um, they should be fast and closed, long enough to cover uh, down beneath your knees. You should always wear pants and long sleeves. So again, we don't, I don't think anybody comes in the shop thinking, oh, I think it would be nice to uh, spill some chemicals on me today. You know, it happens by accident, that's why it's called that. Um, and we can, um, we can mitigate the, uh, the risks by dressing appropriately. So if you know you're doing something that's going to involve you know, etching plugs, then um, you know, make sure that you're, you're wearing some pants, or I would advise the team to, to buy a couple large pairs of pants that we just keep in there that you can go to the bathroom and change into if, you're, if you are handling that and you realize that you, know, you, you, didn't, you, you came dressed inappropriately. Um, because you're, you're, you're going to get some of these things on your, uh, your skin if you don't protect yourself. So what we're doing, we're um, I'll be ordering some lab coats. Uh, I meant to have them uh, after last week's meeting. I just forgot. So we'll have lab coats that are hanging on the, uh, the apron rack that you can use for uh, for this purpose. Um, if you're doing something like uh, working with the uh, the acid, another good uh, good precaution, in addition to wearing a uh, lab coat and of course eye protection, is to go ahead and uh, take a five gallon bucket, put some water in it, so that if something does happen and, and uh, you splash it, you get some of it on your hand where you should be wearing gloves. But if you get something on 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 a, on, a, on, a, on a bare skin, then you can immediately dump that part of your body in the uh, the water um, before you have uh, you, you receive any uh, serious injury. Yes. Um, one thing that we don't really have in the shop, at least as far as I know, is acid resistant gloves. Um, so that might be something. To do with yep. Well. And we, and we uh, talk about that. So we're going to buy some uh, buy, buy probably two pairs. Um, 
because you're right, the nitrile gloves are uh, are not suitable. The acid would uh, quickly for about dissolve those. Yeah, so it's questionable whether or not you can even get them off your hands in time, right? Yeah, so we're going to, but we, we just got to go to Lowe's and get some uh, some dishwashing gloves. Um, but, but that's absolutely right. We need to uh, to invest in some uh, some PPE, some personal protective equipment, so that we can we can all enforce these rules safely. Right, and always plan for uh, or always think ahead of what to do in case there's a spill. So with chemical handling, say you're carrying some chemicals over to the backside of the shop, keep in mind what you're going to do if there's a spill. If you, say, drop a bottle of acetone and it opens and spills on the ground, you should know already what you're going to do in that case. Um, obviously, just some small paper towels aren't going to clean it up, so there's some large absorbent towels that you could get from the shop to put on to help uh, pick up the spill quickly, uh, take them off to it. We also have a spill kit that's located above the fire cabinet. You just need to be aware of what you do in case of a chemical spill. And all spills must be cleaned up immediately. Uh, spills, whether it's water or uh, a chemical that you're using, hazardous chemicals, any type of sub substance need, needs to be cleaned up immediately. Flammable liquids must be dispensed and used in a well-ventilated area so that the vapors don't accumulate. So in our shop, that means using one of the two ceiling-mounted exhaust fans. There's one in the uh, wood shop area, and there's one in the welding shop area. Or setting up uh, one of the portable fans to ensure that the fumes don't accumulate. Um, if you're dispensing chemicals using the exhaust fan in the welding shop, I would say it's called the welding shop for a reason. Right? It's set up so that we can do welding. We can do things to generate hot sparks and molten metal, and we would know just common sense now, after sitting through this morning, that, God bless you, that um, you know, that would not be the, the location for dealing with, uh, with chemicals. So in this case, just because of the, the, the logistics, the, the amount of space that we have, since that's where one of our exhaust fans is, is mounted, then you need to make sure that you're, you're responsible for, uh, for, yeah, let me rephrase that. You are responsible for ensuring that no welding or using a plasma cut or anything else is generating heat is taking place while you have the, uh, the chemicals out of the, uh, the storage cabinet and in the, uh, the welding shop. And if you're using one of the portable exhaust fans, always be aware of where you're blowing those fumes to. Say you're working in the wood shop area doing some composites work, and you set up the fan to blow the fumes away from your work area, you may be blowing those fumes into the lab table area, which will then go into the uh, computer area by the mills. It can go everywhere but you're working. I've seen that happen before where uh, working in the, at the lab tables, it's just a horrible smell that was getting me dizzy. Then I'd walk over to where the work was being done, and to my surprise, it, didn't, it barely smelled over there despite that being the source of the fumes. So you should always be aware of uh, where you're directing the fumes to, and so obviously the best solution is to use the exhaust fan because it will pick up those fumes and disperse them in a, to a safer place rather than dispersing it to the rest of the shop. Uh, big thing I think the one you're talking about is anytime we do engine idle or engine testing uh, to make sure that the engine's running before we take it out of the shop to go testing, um, those fumes build up quickly in the shop and the exhaust fan did not like consciously placed and we don't shift the car closer towards the back of the garage door, those fumes quickly go right around that into the welding shop and back through the rest of the lab. And anyone next to the car doesn't really notice the difference, but everyone else is uh, getting, like feeling dizzy and yep. like making it harder for work for them. Right, even with the car on idle and the garage door open, exhaust facing the garage door almost out into the open air, there's been times where we haven't set up the exhaust fan and Mike has come out complaining to us, saying he's smelling all these exhaust fumes. In my office. Yes, mm -hmm. all the way in his office, so the complete other there. side of the shop. Kyle? Yeah, that's carbon monoxide that it's actually putting out because we don't have a catalytic converter at all. So, so it's so better to of the exhaust gases. Okay, next one says always dispense chemicals over a steel, uh, I'm giving a reason, an example, a steel cookie tray to contain spills in your work area. So again, plan for this because it's going to happen to you one time when you're dispensing chemicals. So be prepared 
Don't dispense them over just a tabletop, over just an empty, uh, over the floor, over your, your work area, because when it does spill, now it's going to be a lot harder to uh, clean it up before it actually gets somewhere that you can't, uh, can't remove it, like absorbed into one of the, the, uh, the butcher block tables or into the, uh, the floor. Um, if you're doing it outside, obviously, then it could get to somewhere where, where again, we, we can't clean it up. So always use some type of um, uh, steel, steel sheet, steel tray, with the plan that if, if, if this gets knocked over or goes south, that it will contain the, uh, the spill so that uh, you can clean all of it up in a uh, responsible manner. So are we going to buy some of those? Yeah, we're going to buy some from Target or Walmart. We'll okay. have, have them for different sizes. So just grab one. They'll, they'll, they, they will sit, I think the best place is right on top of the chemical storage cabinet. So we'll have a shelf, a little shelf up here. We'll have a couple trays. Just grab one, dispense over those. Uh, never use containers open while working and immediately return them to the couple storage cabinets after each use. This is one that's, uh, that's easy to violate. You think, okay, I'm using some acetone and I'm doing some work with it and I'm going to use it again in five minutes. So uh, it's, it's, uh, you, you can forget and just leave the, uh, or, or consciously, just leave the, uh, the top off it. Obviously that's going to allow some, uh, some material to evaporate, but here's the uh, much bigger risk. Because you're students, you have flexible schedules, you have things that come up uh, um, quickly. So if you're doing that and you have the uh, lid off and you, and, and you intend, you have the best intentions to use it again in three minutes, you get a phone call, you've got to go help somebody, you can step out and you, you can easily see how you can leave the shop, let, leave, leave that container open, and now it can go south from, uh, from there. Um, to an example, you know, just which, where it's left uh, opened all night, next morning, Murphy tells us that's when we'll have an inspection, or even worse, somebody's working around it and they, they knock it over. Uh, obviously now we have un, uh, uh, yeah, we, we have a bunch of chemical that we're trying to uh, clean up. So immediately after using it, put the uh, lid back on it. Yes, uh, AJ, you had a question or comment for the previous point? Um, this is a question kind of relating to that something I saw. Where was, maybe I just didn't hear it, but where was the waste accumulation area in the shop? Uh, it will be designated. Right now, um, the containers are stored by the bay door on our side of the shop by the laser table. We may move it to the uh, other side uh, by the welding area, um, separated by the curtain. Yes, by the curtain. Um, I'm trying to figure out which is the best spot to locate it because obviously um, over by the welding shop, uh, we don't necessarily want it there, but we also have some of our safety stuff by the laser table. So a sign will be posted up in the shop designating it as the satellite waste accumulation area. So that will show you where it should be. And if it ever changes, you'll see that the sign has moved. So always put the waste containers back to that spot. Final point about E before we move on is um, the second part where it says immediately return them to the couple storage cabinets after each use. This is something that is a, can, can it cause a uh, problem in our particular work environment because we use um, some solvents. We use, for instance, acetone for prepping uh, materials before they're, uh, they're being welded. And this can, uh, again, it could cause a, uh, a serious accident if somebody is uh, using acetone, they clean some parts, they move the acetone bottle to where they think it's far enough away, the acetone can, sitting over here, they put the lid back on it, they continue welding, somebody else turns around and says, oh, I need some, I, I need some acetone, and on the way over they say, oh, here's the acetone bottle. So they, they pick it up, dispense what they, what they need, start talking to, to their friends, start, start looking at who's welding, and then they put it down, and it starts to get closer and closer to, the, uh, to where the welding's going on, and then finally someone else comes over and picks up the, the big welder and starts welding on something over here, again, because they saw welding going on, and now a spark can get into um, you know, an unopened container, or if we're using a plastic dispenser, obviously the sparks are going to go right through that plastic and ignite that, uh, that, that bottle of material. So this is something that um, we just have to be uh, um, disciplined about, um, it means uh, you know, get a little more walking if you're doing welding because you're often cleaning parts uh, quite a bit when you, when you are welding, but we need to uh, keep them safely in the cabinet so that there's no risk of, uh, the, uh, of, of us igniting that, uh, that volatile chemical. F says keep only small quantities of flammable materials available for immediate use, so half a liter or, or less. So this is done using, um, uh, using the, uh, the plastic dispenser bottles. So we'll have, uh, we'll have a couple of those bottles on hand so you can, uh, you, you can use those as necessary. And it says, the next one says, large amounts um, should not be stored out on uh, open bench tops. 
So same thing, we're, we would need to, uh, to keep large quantities in the chemical storage cabinets, dispense them um, immediately into a, a smaller container, and that's what would be used in the, uh, the, the work area. Does that include the acetone? So that would be put in smaller bottles? Uh, you wouldn't want to put the acetone in a smaller bottle unless it has a lid on it, because it will just evaporate in the air. Uh, it's not that difficult to just put it back in the cabinet uh, when you're using it. Uh, it's really not that much additional work. But if you do happen to have a bottle with a sealed lid that will, that's also appropriate for storing acetone, so it's one of the points that we mentioned earlier that you should only use the original container or um, the appropriate container that can hold that type of substance. Uh, so if you have that type of container to pour it in a, um, pour a small amount in, that would be acceptable. But make sure that that container is sealed and can hold that liquid. So the answer to your, to your question is that, yes, it would apply to acetone. We, we can't leave a gallon of acetone sitting out you know, day after day. But if, if, if we had a half liter container of acetone, it would not violate EHNS policy to leave that half liter, that small acetone bottle or can sitting out. For us, we're going to, again, keep the chemicals in the, uh, the, the, the cabinet. So if you find yourself using it, uh, we use it regularly, then we need to put it in a uh, smaller container. And it is a good idea to always put the chemical back into the fire cabinet when you're, um, even if you're going to use it in a few minutes, uh, aside from the point that Mike stated with a few minutes may turn into 30 minutes based on getting a phone call. Uh, and as he mentioned with welding, I've seen before where someone left a bottle of acetone on one of the welding tables and proceeded to start welding. Even though the bottle of acetone was about, say, three to five feet away from the welding area, the bottle was on the metal table. Metal conducts heat, even though it's a large metal table. Uh, for all we know, that'd be enough to heat up the container over time and cause an explosion. So it's a good idea to always take the chemicals and put them back in the cabinet to ensure that there are no fires, there are no spills, you don't have an excessive amount of chemicals laying out in the shop at all. Or we do get inspected, yes. absolutely. So it's just that's the policy we're going to enforce. Keep the chemicals in the, in, the, in the cabinet when you're not using them. Yeah, put them back. Right, and not just for inspections. These rules are here for a reason. They're here for safety. So, of course, we want to try to do our best for the inspection, but we also want to try to uphold all these rules every single time we're in the shop. They're set for a reason. As strict as some of them may be, we should always follow them as thoroughly as we can. Yeah, four graduate students in the last year have died in uh, university labs from violating a couple of, of these rules. So that's how serious it can be. It's not just something that can send you to the hospital, which obviously is, is a huge disaster, but some, something that can, uh, can kill us. Right, and some may not have been from just ignoring the rules. Sometimes it's been ignorance of these rules. So one case that Mike pointed out in our previous meeting was uh, some girl at another university, to another university, mm -hmm. was dealing with some chemicals, wasn't wearing her an appropriate lab coat or a lab coat at all, and she spilled the chemicals on her body. Uh, later, she ended up dying due to she mixed the chemicals then, and it exploded, and then and then everything like all the chemicals got in her body, right? Yes. So they they uh, concluded that even a lab coat could have been the difference between her pulling out of ICU and and her passing away. Yeah. So. Uh, that point brings me to if someone new comes into the shop, um, most likely they're not going to be aware of these rules. So all of you that have attended this uh, lecture are responsible for making sure anyone in the shop, new or a current member, that you see them abiding by these rules exactly as they're stated by EHNS. Uh, sometimes one of us may forget one of the rules or it may just uh, skip over our head. It happens. That's why we have multiple people here, so we can ensure that not only is the person dealing with the chemical or equipment that they're safe, but so is everyone around us. Because one bottle causing a fire can lead to the rest of the shop catching on fire, say it reaches the fire cabinet. Now all of a sudden we have a large explosion. It's something we want to avoid, even in small amounts. 
kind of takes us into chemical and hazardous waste. So the first, the most important point is that chemicals must never be disposed of down drains and trash or by evaporation methods. So it doesn't matter what the, uh, what, what the chemical is, we have to dispose of it the, uh, in, in an appropriate and responsible manner. Uh, chemical waste is required to be held at the waste satellite accumulation area. So Dylan spoke about that. It's on either, it'll be on one side of the SA garage bay door. Um, it must be stored there until ready for pickup and the accumulation area will be identified with a sign. So for um, speaking specifically about chemical waste containers, they uh, must be, the, uh, the waste must be accumulated in a sealable original container, or if we don't have the original container anymore, a steel container. So again, we, we can't just put something in a gallon jug because it was convenient and we found one in the, uh, the shop, but we have to uh, store it responsibly because we don't know if it's going to be there for two days or, or for two months before we're able to, uh, to, to get the H&S to uh, collect it. Um, next point is the containers must be kept closed uh, when they're uh, in the inclination area, except when adding waste to the uh, container. That was pretty straightforward. We, we, we don't want to allow them to, uh, to evaporate over time because that's just as uh, irresponsible as dumping it you know, outside into the, the environment. So that the whole, whole, one of the goals of this program is to, uh, to, to make sure that the bulk waste is disposed of responsibly. Uh, C says a funnel cannot be left in the container. So this is a very important uh, point. And it's easy to uh, violate this strictly because of laziness. Um, we use a funnel so that we can get the waste into the, uh, the primary container. So if I draw the funnel, we have a funnel like this. We pour it into the, uh, the, the five gallon primary container. We cannot ever leave this funnel in there because what happens if, if somebody knocks this over? Obviously the lid's off, this is not sealed. So we've just violated the whole principle of having the uh, secondary containment uh, um, vessel. So that is a, that, that, that's a common uh, fine that labs get. Just because of convenience, they leave that funnel in there, and we, we, we cannot do that. So the, uh, um, the procedure that they'll come up with is that the funnel, I believe, you can correct me if I'm wrong, will be stored inside the chemical storage cabinet. And when you need it for dispensing, and it, uh, this, is right, this is very close, so you grab it out of here, put it in there, dispense your chemical, take it back, and replace it when you're done. That way nobody can make the mistake of just conveniently leaving it in the open container. Right, it's not much effort. Um, the funnel will quite literally be about five to 20 feet away from the chemical storage containers. It's not much effort to grab it from there or put it back in there. And at the end of the day, it may prevent a spill. And if that's all it does, then that's great. We don't want to see any spills, so let's take the extra effort to store the funnel in the fire cabinet. We cannot overfill these containers. We need to leave at least an inch of headspace. That's measured from the, the top of the, uh, the container. So the spill line, we need to have, have at least an inch of airspace up here to allow for expansion, uh, thermal expansion. Um, we, uh, we can contact the h and for, uh, for pickup before it gets full. And this is when they come out to uh, pick it up, they're likely going to want to do a, uh, a facility inspection. So we need to be prepared for that. Um, alternatively, we could take it to one of the, uh, the waste um, authorized disposal centers in town that, uh, that we spoke of earlier. So this is something when if you identify something that needs to be uh, disposed of, just let the shop safety coordinator know or let anybody on the e-board know or let me know and I will uh, uh, help you figure out how to, uh, how to do that in, in a swift manner. Yes, and if you see that the, one of the chemical waste containers is getting close to having that one inch of headspace remaining, then tell us. Yes, because we don't want to wait until we have that last inch because uh, we may get lazy, it happens to all of us, and it may overfill past the point of that one inch headspace. So we want to try to get, the, get this chemical waste out of the shop before it even reaches that. So if you notice that the container is at 75% capacity, or which will most likely be under the one inch of headspace, please notify someone or if you're able to take care of it yourself, say uh, one of you becomes shop manager in the future, uh, please take care of it responsibly, dispose of it um, at one of the authorized disposal centers in town or by contacting EHS. Carly? The part where you said this is a good time for a facility inspection, um, did you get that from some source or is that something you're just concluding? It's a um, pretty good assumption. Yes, a good assumption we because were, we're telling we, we were politely uh, given some tips by a, a EHNS um, member. So 
and then they want to do this to help us, right? They want to help us and help us identify, and that, that's what he did. He came through and did a, a, a basically a mock inspection for us, and as he was going through these things, you know, uh, raised our awareness of, uh, of this. That's something that they, they like to do. When, when they come out, it's not always a, a, a raised awareness visit. It is a, okay, I have to use some citations. So it's kind of like a parking ticket. Sometimes you, know, you have to get somebody that's, that's you know, it's at the right time of the, uh, the year that there's going to give you a warning. Other times they have to give you a citation because it, it is their, their job. I just feel like that is true. Wouldn't that like scare people away from calling them on set? They can. And that's, that's, a, that's a common problem at our university. I think others are, uh, are, are, are facing. Um, so it's really important that the university gets the right, the right atmosphere, um, the right people in the um, in, in, in that office, yet if, if there is no um, penalty of, in this case, I think the, the financial risk is really what, what motivates um, a lot of the, uh, the, the, the rule compliance. If there is, uh, without that basically stick to motivate, then, then uh, this trickles down to students and, and users of the facility not, not having to go that extra mile to really have a, have a safe environment. Yeah, so, so you, you really hit the nail on the head there. It's a, uh, it's a fine line. The next one says, don't contaminate used oil with solvents or heavy metals. So we're going to have two of these waste containers, two of the five pound waste containers. One's marked oil, one's marked uh, solvents. We don't want to, uh, we, we want to try not to, uh, to mix those two. So if you're taking oil out of the car, you're taking oil out of the other uh, brake system, um, then that would obviously go in the, uh, the oil lubricants um, container. If you're using anything else like acetone or, or brake clean, or any type of a solvent, that goes in the, in, in the solvent container. So we, uh, we, we want to make sure that when eh and looks at it, if, if, where we take it to dispose of it, if this is marked oil and it looks like it's got 50% of it is solvents, they're not going to really know how to process that. Same thing with the solvents. If it looks like it's got two gallons of oil mixed in with the solvents, then they might, it's going to be harder for them to, uh, to just accept that and dispose of, us, uh, just dispose of it properly. So as the original users, we need to, uh, to try our hardest to, uh, to separate those wastes into their distinct uh, containers. Yes. And now there's obviously going to be times where you're going to say, take a part to spray oil off of it using brake clean, and you will mix the oil and the brake clean together, brake clean being the solvent. Uh, you're going to do that over the solvent container. A small amount of oil into that solvent container would be accepted uh, just because it's almost unavoidable. It's bound to happen with us, but if something's coated in oil, please try to first clean it off with a rag uh, so you'll uh, take as much off as you can with the rag and then you'll dispose of that rag in an oily rag container then you can take that part and spray it with the brake clean to get the remainder of the oil off. But you want to do your best to try to keep them separate from each other. Probably the solvent container should most likely contain less than 2% of any type of oil. Uh, something that when they're disposing of it is not going to be crucial to their uh, process of disposing. Uh, chemical waste containers must be stored in secondary containers at 110% of the volume of the primary container. We already talked about that, um, and we, uh, we have that. The secondary container, this is an important point, says it must remain spill-free. Clean up immediately when necessary. So this is something that uh, we've, we've violated in the, uh, the past, and it's a, uh, it, it takes conscious uh, effort to, to make sure that we do this responsibly. So there's like, a lid in the top of this five-gallon container. I have the, uh, the funnel drawn in here for. If anything gets, gets uh, out of the, the funnel and ends up right down the side of this container, we cannot have any chemical inside the uh, secondary containment vessel. So if that happens, then you just take, take this out, you know, wipe this up, clean this up. If, if, it's, if it's a lot of liquid, then we, we have the, uh, the absorbent um, towels that are in the, uh, the lab cabinet. I can show you where those are when we get back. So we're going to, uh, we have to clean this up and keep this secondary containment uh, uh, vessel, keep that clean and dry. Right, and while you may never intend to spill anything into that secondary container, and while you may never see a spill, on occasion a small drop may land on the side at, of the primary container, and now you have, over time, some residue spilling onto the bottom. So over a period of a few months, uh, a puddle at the bottom of, or at the bottom of both containers, so inside the secondary container, may accumulate. So you should be uh, looking at the secondary container in use, take it out, and make sure that there's no oil in the bottom. If there is, please clean it up. And when you're cleaning it up, you may still feel some residue 
uh, just because oil likes to stick to some surfaces and it's hard to get off, as long as there is no actual puddle in there, that's acceptable. Residue is expected being a secondary containment hub for oil. Just make sure that there is no puddles of oil at the bottom of the container. And the last two points deal with the, uh, the labels. We have to have the, the containers labeled. So in case of emergency or just in case of normal uh, disposal, they, they know what's in there. So the uh, point H talks about uh, listing the percentages of the, uh, the contents. So for instance, in our solvents container, since we primarily use acetone and brake cleaner, was there anything else or was that, those were the, uh, the main two? Yes. Most of we use it, the solvent based. That's probably 80% of the solvents that we use, acetone and brake yeah. cleaner. So the, car cleaner okay, so car cleaner. So we, we, we need to, uh, to approximate what, what we think uh, the, those percentages are. So we're making up the, uh, the label. Uh, I'll work with you on that. And labels are always available from my uh, HNS. Dylan went there the other day yes. and uh, got a uh, very good supply. This will last us for uh, two or three years. So we have uh, every, all, all those supplies. Right. You can call EHS at the number listed on this document and they'll gladly ship the labels to our lab. Or you can go to uh, their facility, which you can look up building 831. It's on the surge area, surge area in the southwest corner of campus. Uh, they'll gladly give you even a stack of 100 labels. Uh, walk into their office and they have thousands and thousands of these labels. It's extremely expensive or extremely inexpensive for them to get and so they'd be glad to give us however many we want. Maybe not a million but they give us a decent stack. Asking for two or three, uh, when I went there uh, on Thursday, the guy kind of chuckled and said, here, I'll give you a large stack. So they have plenty to give. Okay, so we need to use their, their labels and fill out all the information I asked for, including uh, my name as the shop supervisor and the, uh, the building room number. So we'll have to fill that out as necessary. So moving on, aerosols. So aerosols are something that we use a lot in the shop. It um, says that these clean aerosol solvents and cleaners must be sprayed over the solvent waste container to ensure the solvent doesn't get on the ground in a trash can, in a drain, etc. Um, so when you're doing this, you're going to open the, uh, the, the, the lid on the secondary containment vessel. Take that, set that aside. Then you're going to open the, uh, the lid on the five gallon um, solvents waste container. I just drawn a little schematic of a spray can, so you're going to put your, your part over the, uh, if you're cleaning it, just hold it over that, that bucket. So obviously the, uh, the bucket will catch everything when you're done, immediately put the lid back on the other bucket, on the primary container, and then put the lid back on the secondary container. Uh, yeah, we need that immediately. We never, never want to have um, a situation where, where we leave one of these, these lids off, because then that's just going to allow the volatile solvents to evaporate. And again, that's, that, that's not helping the environment. And that's really what these, a lot of these rules are in place to, to do. You know, we need to responsibly track our waste solvents. Right. And when you're using one of these containers, please try to remember that because this does have chemical waste in it, and especially that the solvent fumes are pretty, pretty hazardous, opening the container, if your face is by it, it's uh, pretty toxic and it can get you pretty dizzy. So remember to open it, keep your face away, don't try to sniff any of the fumes because it's pretty potent. Um, and always expect chemicals to be in there, even if it feels light, there may be, um, say, a couple milliliters in there, and because they're in there, some of the, uh, some, a lot of it may just be fumes rather than liquid. Still opening it, if you get all those fumes in your face, it, it's not going to make you feel well. And also do this away from any welding or angle grinding, anything where there's flames or sparks, because those uh, spark can go and hit one of those fumes and cause a fire. Yeah. Yes, Kyle. What about spray paints? That's something we use a lot in the shop. Are yeah. they supposed to be sprayed over? Spray paint should be sprayed in an area where there is an exhaust fan. What about? Okay. Traditionally, we do it outside. Proper ven ventilation. So doing it outside, we uh, we cannot condone that. Okay. There is good ventilation outside, but we need to have a, a way to, um, to collect all the, the, uh, the product when it cures. So if you do, if you were to do it outside, you make sure you, you put down a large piece of bisqueen that can capture the, uh, the, the dry solids. Same thing in, in the shop. We would put down a large piece of the bisqueen so that way it doesn't get on the, uh, the equipment and the, the floor. 
and the, the fumes are taken care of with the proper uh, ventilation. The energy park is, is a good place to, uh, to paint them because you don't have to worry about people walking by and stepping on what you're doing or being in someone else's way. And there's plenty of room out there to, to put a nice large piece of S-Queen to responsibly catch everything. Yeah. Uh, it's just, um, for like smaller components, we traditionally just done them in the tree outside. So the welding shop is, is, is a good solution. Okay. Right? We've got a nice big, big, big table. Just put down a piece of S-Queen. It can be the same piece. We just fold up like a tablecloth. Just lay it down, okay. turn on the exhaust fan, paint it, and it's all taken care of. Luther? Um, to the point? Yeah. Uh, the aerosol cans. Uh, I know in the past I've sometimes used like brake clean, uh, put it on like a paper towel or something yeah. to then go wipe something off yeah. and just like blast apart. What would be the proper procedure there? Did, did you just switch to acetone or like spray put, the rag over the solvent? Hold can your rag right here over, over the uh, solvent scan. So again, we, we want to have a procedure in place to show that we are trying to collect everything that potentially all, all the solvent waste that we potentially generate. So we we would want to you know, put the uh, put uh, apply the solvent to the the rag or the solvent container and then go to to our item. What do you do with the rag? Is that we we have two containers. One is marked same way. One is yeah. marked oil. One is marked uh, solvent. So the yellow and, one. And we solvent. dispose of them um, uh, in, in the appropriate <coughs> bin. It will be a steel container, so it may not be yellow. So just look for the appropriate label. Uh, no. Um, not yet, but we have some plastic bins. Yeah, the HS would like us to have steel ones. It makes sense. So we'll, we'll yes. get some steel ones. And the containers will also be sealed. Uh, that's actually mentioned later in the document. Um, and I just will mention this now while the question is presented. If you have the rag and it's still, say, covered in acetone, where if you put it in the container, some of that will seep to the bottom. You don't want to have that because an accumulation of the waste at the bottom of that container, well, it's not. An appropriate waste uh, hazardous waste container. So you want to make sure that um, if it is still coated in a lot of the solvent, you take it over to the hazardous waste container, then squeeze it out using appropriate gloves to make sure you're not getting them on your hand. So you squeeze it dry into that waste container, then dispose of it in the appropriate container for the rags. So that brings us to our next point with oily rags. Oily rags must be disposed of in an oily rags container. They cannot be placed on the lids of garbage can. So that's a frequent problem that we've seen. Okay. Okay. So, yes, we want the container sealed at all times. It's easy for someone to walk away and accidentally leave the container sealed. So always make sure that this is sealed. Um, and again, as I mentioned, make sure that there is no waste that accumulates at the bottom. Squeeze all rags into the appropriate chemical waste container that you will be throwing in there. Now, aerosol can disposal. Um, completely empty cans can be placed in the trash. Simple as that. It may be surprising, but that's the standard that eh has set out. Non-empty cans must be placed in a sealed container labeled with hazardous waste and picked up by EHS. With that, any time you do it, Please remove the nozzle. You don't want a bunch of um, aerosol cans in the same container just bumping into each other, and that can cause unintentional discharges. And what you'll notice with some aerosol cans is that even if you take off the um, nozzle, there's still a, a little white plastic piece that the nozzle is connected to. If you can't remove it, do so as well, because you can still press down on that uh, white piece and spray some of the uh, liquids out. If you can't pull it out, uh, I'm sure it would be completely acceptable to take a pair of um, scissors and then just cut the nozzle as short as you can so there's less of a chance of it spraying unintentionally. Okay, it takes us into fire safety. So University issue fire extinguishers must always be clearly visible. So you'll see several that are around the shop. The, uh, the main one for an SA space is right by the, uh, the small entry door. Um, and that's the, uh, the primary one that uh, this rule applies to because it's easy to uh, stack things up in front of it. It's a convenient floor space uh, in a place where our floor space is uh, highly coveted. But we must, um, we must understand that if we can't clearly identify where the extinguisher is in case of emergency, in case you know, something does go up, it does, come, does ignite, and we need to put the fire out, that's not the time to try and figure out you know, where, where, where the fire extinguisher goes. They can't see it um, behind all the boxes that are stacked in front of it. 
Right. And uh, what I've done is I've placed uh, yellow and black hazard tape in that area. So the area where um, the yellow and black hazard tape is, that's supposed to be blocking off where you cannot store any sort of um, container, anything in general. So we must have that walking space there. So if you see anything blocking the walking space, walking space, please move it to the appropriate area that it should be, or contact someone to ask them where it should be, because there must be access to that fire extinguisher. And the reason why that fire extinguisher must have, we must have access to it, as opposed to even if we had 20 fire extinguishers of our own set up on the laser table right by that fire extinguisher, this fire extinguisher is checked by EHNS. They do um, several inspections. They range from monthly to yearly inspections to ensure that that fire extinguisher is still safe and can still operate. Even if you see that this fire extinguisher has been in the shop since the 90s and you're wondering how can it still possibly be good, it's because uh, they're doing these inspections to make sure that it's still in working standards. Okay. So other safety rule, fire safety rules. Uh, everyone must know how to operate a fire extinguisher, so we can uh, we can go over that when we walk back to the uh, to the shop. It just has a, uh, a safety pin that you pull, and then it's got a trigger that you uh, you pull. When you discharge the extinguisher, you want to aim it at the the base of the fire. If there's ever any doubt as to whether you should use the extinguisher, then use it. You know, the, the, the university keeps them here for a reason. They would much rather hear, yeah, we had something, you know, we, we thought it was going to need it, we used it. Uh, you need to refill it. That's fine. It served its purpose. So don't wait to see, oh, is someone else going to be able to put this out by blowing on it like a, like, 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 like a, a cake candle. Um, you know, use the, uh, the extinguishers if you need them and make sure that you feel comfortable uh, doing that as a, uh, as a user of our facility. Okay, if you don't, just talk to any of us and we'll, we'll, we'll show you how to, uh, how to use one properly. And also spray the fire extinguisher in a sweeping motion and stand a far enough distance away so you won't receive any burns. And on pretty much all fire extinguishers, if you look on the side, it will have instructions on how to use it. All fire extinguishers are fairly the same, whereas Mike said you pull the pin, aim at the base of the fire, spray, sweep, stand safe enough distance away, and that's the simplicity of using the fire extinguisher. Chemicals should never be used in the welding shop while welding is taking place. So we went through the example of that before, so this should make, uh, make a lot of sense to us now. As users of the chemicals in our facility, you need to, uh, to make sure that you're enforcing this each and every time. If welding is performed in the lab, a 10-foot radius, oops, that one was, was uh, updated right before the meeting, a 10-foot radius needs to be cleared out around the, uh, the area. So example, a few years ago, we had a, a student that was doing, um, started out TIG welding something, which doesn't generate any sparks, and then that, uh, that changed into, what, well, I need to get this done quicker, so I'm going to use the MIG welder instead. And didn't pay attention to the location of one of the, uh, the mobile trash cans, and a spark went into the trash can and ignited the, the trash can. Um, so we need to, uh, again, whoever's doing the welding, to survey the area, make sure that there's nothing in the vicinity that could, uh, could catch fire. That includes, uh, yeah, rags, and anything that uh, a rag hasn't been, put, hasn't been put away properly, that has, uh, you're not gonna know what it's on, what, what's on it, just assume that it has a volatile substance that if it comes into contact with, with a flame or a spark, it's going to, uh, to ignite. Yeah, um, that trash can also had brake cleaning sprayed in it right before that happened. So that's, that's part of the reason too. But yes, and that's something <laughs> as you can see how violating one rule yeah. can, can cause can, can lead to the accident, and, that, and that's usually what does happen. It's it's, a, it's not one rule necessarily that that is broken, but rather uh, two in sequence that leads to um, a serious problem. Okay, laboratory equipment. Uh, this one's pretty straightforward. If you're using the uh, compressed gas cylinders, that means if you're putting them on or off the welders or you find a need to transport them in the lab, then familiarize yourself with the, uh, the rules. They'll be laminated and placed on the compressed gas tanks that are used in the, uh, the shop. But basically, they just tell us um, how to ensure that there's no way a bottle can tip over um, with an unprotected valve where the valve could be knocked off uh, the bottle and turn that bottle into a, uh, um, uh, basically a missile. One of those compressed gas cylinders can go right through a concrete wall. They have that much uh, pressure inside them, so they just uh, give us um, some tips for um, handling the, uh, the bottles safely. So again, you'll find those on the, on the bottles. If you have any questions, then come talk to me about that. Yes. And I've also uh, placed this document in a binder labeled SA Shop Safety Guide. It's located right next to the MSDS folder on top of the fire cabinet. Uh, 
In that folder, you also see uh, this document that we're presenting right now, as well as any document we reference uh, during this lecture. So with that, there is a chemical waste guide uh, written by EHS, a lab safety guide also written by EHS, um, how to deal with fires, uh, personal injuries, and chemical spills. So all of those will be located in this folder, and you can access them at any time you need to. Second point says compressed gas cylinders must be supported by a secure chain attached to the upper third of the tank. So when they're being stored on the welders, it's not acceptable to use string, bungee cord, etc. Uh, pieces of wire. Yes, the teams in, in, in the past teams have used all of those to, uh, to attach the other uh, tanks. So all of our welders have been uh, upgraded so that they have uh, chain, proper chains on them to support them uh, securely. So we need to, uh, to use those. We would never leave a freestanding tank in the uh, lab anywhere. We have to chain it to the wall, so there's no way someone could walk by, bump into it, and knock it over. Uh, third one is extension cords running across the public areas where there's foot traffic must be secured to prevent tripping hazards. So we have some uh, some caution tape, duct tape works, anything, so that uh, we, if, if you have to run an extension cord across the floor for some for some reason, you want to be mindful that you're not going to uh, uh, create a tripping hazard that causes somebody else to get seriously injured. If you take out an extension cord, make sure you put it away before you leave the, uh, the shop that night. Again, even if you, if you uh, yeah, if you find yourself taking out an extension cord multiple times for the same thing, like every time you come into to the shop, then tell somebody, and that just means that we should have an electrician come in and add an outlet that's more conveniently located for you. Yes, Luther? Uh, with the uh, jig welder, there's three or four wires that have to get strung to wherever the welding is, and that's usually yep. across uh, a traffic to keep the machine out of the way. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the what I would suggest is that uh, since those, those, those cables are large in diameter that you wrap those, um, you just run, run, run a loop with the caution tape around it so at least we've increased the visibility to uh, try and mitigate the, uh, the tripping risk and also when you're, when you're done using it you, you, you put it back away, unhook the, uh, the cable for, for the night so don't, don't leave it, um, don't leave it if, if the welder has to leave the, uh, the shop. Just don't leave it out. And also remember that when you're ever routing any type of cord, whether it's from the TIG welder or an extension cord, do not um, route it around a sharp corner, uh, under anything that may press against it. Anything that can, that can cause wire damage, we don't want to have that happen. I'm very protective of my wires on the car, but we should also be protective of the wires that we use to use any of the equipment, because there may be damage to the conductors inside that cord that we may not be able to see, or there can be damage to the insulation that will then expose the conductors and can, if someone happens to pick that up while it's uh, still plugged in, they have the potential of getting shocked or... Distributed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Very serious. Uh, did you have a comment? I did, but never mind. Okay. okay. And the last one, the manufacturer's operating manual should be kept with the, uh, with the instrument or with the, the equipment. And that is so that you can uh, you can reference it, and uh, if you're using something, you should be aware of the risk. Just like if, if you use a lathe or a mill in the uh, the shop, or a drill press, or a grinder or a sander, you know we take you through the uh, the safety. So basically, we give you these safety rules. But there will be times when you're using something that wasn't covered in the uh, the basic training, so you need to familiarize yourself with, with the safety so that you can use it in a uh, in a responsible and uh, and safe manner. Uh, SA will have a um, a file. In the, I believe, a uh, dedicated file, the file cabinet, where they keep all the uh, the manuals in one place, so they're they're convenient for you to uh, to locate. That takes us into food and drinks, and basically this says if there if if, if the lab if any portion of the shop is a place where chemicals are dispensed or used, it cannot be a place where, where we eat food. Um, so H H S is uh, pretty clear on that. If there are dedicated areas, let's say the the team decides. I think we're, you're, you're still in discussion about this. And the team decided that, oh, I'm not even gonna continue on that. We're going to, to, to finalize policy on, uh, on food and drink so that we are in compliance and we can do it in a way that uh, causes the least amount of inconvenience to our, to our team. We understand it is a privilege to be able to bring something into the shop and eat it to make glasses or you know, when, you're, when you're running there for a, uh, for a meeting. So we would like to continue that, but we have to uh, make sure that we can do it in a way that's responsible and in, uh, in, in full compliance. Yes, and if you happen to be bringing food into the shop, um, aside from making sure you don't bring it into the work areas, such as onto the welding table or by the laser table, 
Also, make sure you clean up after yourself. It sometimes gets really disgusting when people leave their trash around. Uh, it can just be uh, can, um, a Coke container or it can be leftover food. We've seen before that people have left out um, five bags from five bags, mostly empty, but there's still, say, mustard, ketchup, and pickles in there. And over time, that just starts smelling really bad, and it's just a disgusting habit. So always pick up after yourself. Eating in the shop is a privilege. Michael has no problem taking this privilege away from us, and anytime he catches someone in the shop, uh, he'll kindly ask them to leave or just kick them out. Now, uh, oftentimes people go and say go to Chipotle to get food there. Uh, if need be, it may turn into you have to eat at Chipotle. Either way, you're still eating, so there's still that same eating time and that same amount of travel time, so if you can, try to avoid eating in the shop. In fact, it's probably a cleaner environment for you to eat at the restaurant. Um, or if you're bringing food to the shop and you don't want to be eating in the shop, there is a uh, table outside the shop across the street that you can kindly eat your pizza on with your buddy. And final comment, if you, if you do bring food into the, uh, the shop, put it in the trash can that's in the, uh, the bathroom. That trash can is emptied every morning, so the, uh, the food, as it wastes, as it spoils, it wastes, there's no chance that it can sit in a uh, trash can that's just partially full for a week while the trash, until it fills up to the, to the, to the, uh, um, the volume that the team disposes of it. Okay, so always put your, your food trash in the bathroom trash can. Yes, and to go with this point, that's also going to the next topic, uh, deals with uh, chemical transportation and cross contamination. So if we do say the lab table area is our designated um, eating area, as well as any public area. A public area is the bathroom, the eating area, or any common area. You're not allowed to bring chemicals through there, or in fact you can't even bring your gloves or lab coat. So if you're working the, at the wood shop, working on some composites, and decide to go over to the lab tables, you need to first take off your uh, coats and take off the gloves, and then you can proceed to go into this public area. Uh, likewise, if you need to transport chemicals, and the quickest option for you is to just go straight through the public area, uh, public heating area, that's unacceptable take the extra time to walk around to avoid any cross-contamination. Because um, for all you know, you may spill something onto the tables, and some people follow the five-second policy with food. I don't know why, but still, if there's a chemical on the table, and you don't know about it, and you're eating, and say a french fry falls, it can pick up some of that chemical. And now, for all you know, you're eating oil and acetone. Or you're still probably eating oil with your french fries, but not the oil on top. Okay, that takes us into miscellaneous. So, we want to minimize or avoid trip hazards. Let's go for we spoke about. Material storage is an important one. Don't put something down to, uh, to store it. Don't just push it away because it's out of your work area. Think about how people, how the, uh, the flow of traffic moves through the shop. And if you were, as you think about it, if you had low light condition and you were trying to move across the SAA shop, um, Oh, is there something that you would trip on? Or not the SSA shop, but, but the, the regular shop. Is there something that you would trip on? So we want to, we want to think about how we, uh, we store the materials in the shop. Uh, aisles can't be used for storage for the same reason. So whether it's the fire marshal, or whether it's the h &S, they come through and do inspections. They want to make sure that as customers, as the users of our facility, you know, the students and the other staff can, um, can evacuate uh, quickly if necessary. Spills must be cleaned up immediately. We spoke about that already. It doesn't matter whether it's water or acetone or brake clean or, or oil. We have to clean it up immediately. Uh, we need to keep all work areas clean. And the reason here, the cleaner it is, the less chance of having an accident. Accidentally tipping over uh, a can of chemical, if I was being diligent to keep it clean and put the chemical back in the cabinet, now it's not there for me to hit with a long tube of material if I'm trying to cope it for the frame or, or do you know, a myriad of the other tasks that we do in the lab. So it's, uh, it's not just for, um, for appreciation that we have a place on campus to work when a lot of other, other groups don't. Um, it's not just an appreciation of that, that we want to keep it clean, but because it does tie into uh, safety. When they come through for an inspection, it's like taking the car to our design event. 
The judges see a car, it looks like a complete pile of junk, and it looks like it was thrown together last minute, and nobody cared about it. They're not going to care about seeing it. So they're already going to be in a, in a bad mood. And inspectors that come through, they're human too. So if it looks like we don't care about it, if it looks like we're pigs, if it looks like we didn't, we, we, we don't even know what the policies are, um, then they're going to be a lot more strict when they uh, when they try and enforce them in our lab and bring them to our attention and give us citations because that's what we'll need at that point for our awareness so that we can become respectful and responsible operators of our facility. Right. So keeping the work area clean is more than just putting your chemicals away after use. It also applies to putting tools away, putting parts away in the appropriate uh, container or cabinet. You want to keep the tables as clean as possible. So oftentimes, uh, someone may be working on some composites and you'll leave them on the table overnight. Now, uh, one part on the table overnight may not be much, but you have to remember, we have over 20 people working in the shop. If each person leaves one part out overnight, all of a sudden the tables become clustered with uh, a bunch of parts, tools that people may forget to put away. So do your best to put at the appropriate spot for where you're storing it. Because uh, at the end of the year, we're all actually going to store it um, on our shelves or somewhere. There's going to be a spot where you need to store it other than just on the tables. Uh, we Recently, we cleaned the shop um, to be more presentable to someone that gave a speech. And I looked in the shop and I see all the tables are cleared of all these parts, all these tools. So at this moment, it's completely doable to store everything in an appropriate spot. So if it's doable now, it's doable the rest of the year as well as every year to come. So put it in a designated spot. If you can't find a spot to put it in, Try to clear out some space on one of the shelves to try to create some space. I took the time to clean out the shelves um, some time ago, and easily I cleaned up about three or four feet of space on one of the shelves, which that's enough space to store a lot of parts. So um, times we may have parts that were from the previous year that we may not use. So look through it and try to find something that we may not use. Um, if you're not sure about it, ask someone. So create space for you to put your part. The next point, don't want to touch on the shortboards. They can't run across floors, under rugs, through walls, doors, windows, uh, ceiling tiles, etc. So anywhere that presents a hazard where they could get uh, cut or the conductors could be damaged, we can't do that. Uh, again, if you find yourself running an extension cord for more than just general purpose, you, you, you're doing the same thing over and over, then let us know and we'll have a, uh, a receptacle put in and like a, a drop down receptacle where it's conveniently located for you to, uh, to eliminate that trip hazard. For sharps, uh, broken glass, razor blades, anything else like that that could uh, um, cut somebody who's handling that, uh, that, that waste, those must be placed in a red plastic sharps container and disposed of as biomedical waste, regardless of whether or not they have um, uh, biological fluids on them. That's a uh, university policy. And for us, an alternative for uh, uncontaminated razor blades, meaning something that has not come in contact with, uh, with, with any blood, is to uh, carefully dull them using a grinder, and then we can put them in the, uh, the steel trash can, the steel welding shop trash can, because that trash is disposed of in a different way. It goes to a steel receptacle where all that material is uh, recycled by an outside uh, vendor, so that's, that doesn't, uh, doesn't apply to standard uh, waste disposal. So it's one or the other. Either you put sharps in a, in a designated container that, that uh, Dylan created in, in the SA shop, or um, try and build them, put them in the steel trash can in the welding shop. And the sharps container will be located on top of the fire cabinet. Um, at the current moment, it may move to a easier spot to access. Um, it's a red container, it should be easy to see. Again, it will be labeled sharp, so always dispose of any sharp objects that you can't dull down and put in the uh, steel container in the fire cabinet. You can put them in the sharps container. Do this with them? This be really better than that one time you use. No. Um, you can, the containers we have for the razor blades, you can still put the razor blades back in the container. Um, we don't want to open drawers in our, in our work, uh, work boxes or fill boxes and see razor blades everywhere. Right. Which is, which is something that happens as, as we close competition. Oh, I need a razor blade for this. I need one for that. And we just say, we'll put them in the toolbox because we're going to reuse them because they're, they're not just one time use for general purpose stuff in, in our shop. So we, we cannot do that. Somebody reaching in there, obviously, that presents a uh, cut hazard. 
Um, so we, we don't want to have the H&S open a toolbox and, and see that. And obviously nobody wants to get cut. Um, so we either put the, uh, the, the, the recycle, the, uh, the used blades back in the blade receptacle, back in the, the container. You, know, so you use them multiple times. Or if you pick something up and you know, oh, I, I need to trim the, these letters out, this vinyl out, and it's dull, this is useless to me, and you're, you have the intention, I'm going to throw this out, you can't just put it in a normal trash can. You have to put it in a sharps container or dispose of it in the welder shop trash can. Okay, that brings us to, oh, actually, Yeah, the last point, operation. Yes. If you're doing anything that, that's going to run overnight, let me know. I need to know when you put up a sign on the, uh, the door, and we'll deal with it individually. So just bring that to my attention. Don't leave something like a vacuum pump running overnight. I need to know that, that there's power consumption going on. We need to leave the lights on. Yes? Uh, back to the power cords. Uh, yes. I didn't, my neighbors were on the ground. Well, I know like, we're going to get really busy around the lap tables, and there's yep. several of the laptops. Yep. There's on my power outlets, and we run the extension cord on the ground. So yep. so that, 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 that same same question came up, and you're absolutely right. So we're going to have a uh, another drop down receptacle added. So it's right there, centrally located for the projector, for our our, uh, our, our meetings, our design meetings, and for laptop use. Oh. An excellent point. Or so you see that you know you've identified. We do that a lot. There's probably a better way. Yeah, and there is. So that's what we're going to we're going to have done. Or if that is necessary um, for the work that you're doing, uh, take some of the safety tape or duct tape at the very least and take down the electrical cord. That way it's clearly visible. The um, extension cord we have is yellow, so you can easily see it, but we want to have it secured firmly to the floor, so that way uh, no one gets caught above their foot and then ends up tripping on that, as well as pulling uh, the cords down with them, which could uh, knock down some laptops and knock over some other stuff that we may not want knocked over. In fact, we don't want anything knocked over. All right, so general safety. Um, we already touched on this, all safety related info. Dylan said it's going to be clear labeled and stored uh, in an area where it can be easily found. So there's going to be a couple of notebooks. Are they all going to be stored on top of the chemical storage cabinet? So the MSDS is close to the other uh, notebooks, Dylan. It's all going to be right there, so everything's, everything's in one place. Yes. Um, it's a um, half inch white notebook. Okay. So everyone knows where the, where the L cabinet is, so it's easy to find. Uh, how to deal with chemical spills, basic injuries, etc. There's a, a document. Um, you know, just read, if, if you know, you want to be able to respond. If, if somebody gets seriously injured, you want to be able to help that person, right? Just, just as a friend, as a, a team member. So this document gives us some uh, uh, outlines, you know, basic uh, responses to, uh, to injuries. It also talks about how to deal with chemical spills. For us, chemical spills are going to be pretty straightforward. We're going to, we're going to use a, a rag or a couple rags to, uh, to, to wipe that up, and then we put the rags in the right uh, um, container, the rag container. Or we can use a um, uh, use some some absorbent material, kind of like kitty litter. And you know, there's a spill kit on top of the of, of the uh, chemical um, storage cabinet. Spill kit, five gallon container that has some uh, uh, some absorbent. So we can throw that down quickly. It'll absorb it. Then we can pick that up and put it in a container, um, just a steel container. We can put it in a plastic bucket. We can put it in something so that it can go to the hazardous waste site that we have in the other uh, shop. We can use, if it's a lot of product that's on the floor, a lot of chemical, we can use a mop, and then the mop is going to go in the, uh, the, the bucket, so it can be disposed of. Or we have the, uh, the 12 inch by 12 inch uh, absorbent mats that are in the chemical storage cabinet at the, uh, of, the, of the, uh, the lab. So I'll probably buy a bunch for SA as well, and we'll keep those on, uh, up here. So again, everything's going to be in one place, so that, that'll be your go-to place if you have a uh, spill. Um, thorough discussion of injury handling is going to be in a, a separate document. It's common injuries that, uh, that, 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 that members or users of our facility could, uh, could sustain. We want to know how to, how to respond to that. So we're going to get that for the lab for all the TA training as well. And in some of the first aid kits, uh, well actually all the first aid kits that we have, there is a booklet on how to deal with basic injuries. Basic injury can range from a cut and they usually extend past that, say, how to deal with someone that has spinal injuries or an object in their eye. So if, you're, if you ever need to know how to deal with the injury, you'll look at that. And it's also good to familiarize yourself with where the first aid kits and eye washing stations are in the shop. So in the shop, we have four first aid kits. One is located by the main entrance of the SAE shop, and another is in the bathroom. Uh, those are the two that are uh, most have most stock in it, and we want to try to use those first. Uh, another one is located by the Baja cart that is to the right of the uh, welding area or welding shop when you're looking 
at the welding shop and the bay doors. And the third is a um, first aid kit that we'll be bringing to the uh, track. Currently, it's located underneath the laser table. It's a yellow uh, fishing toolbox. So it has a first aid label on it. So if, you, if there is an emergency where you have to use it, please help yourself to using that. It's first aid, uh, first aid, uh, like bandages, anything in there is replaceable. Um, injuries may not be. So use what you can or use what you need to to deal with the first aid situation. As for eye washing stations, there is one above the first aid kit on the SAE side by the bay door. There is one by the um, rotisserie. rotisserie by uh, by the lab tables in between the lab tables and the laden laden mills. And then there's two inside the bathroom. And I believe that's all, as well as a, um, a stock of supplies in one of the cabinets by the bay door on my side, which all the first aid kits will have an inventory uh, kept track for them. And anytime we run below the mandatory or the supplies that we need, we'll stock up on them. So some of these supplies we'll have to go out and buy at Walmart or Target. Uh, it's actually cheaper to go out and buy from them as opposed to buying it through EHS. So keep that in mind. And that takes us to what we've done today, especially training sessions. So we just want everybody to go through this uh, this meeting once, and we'll probably ask you each semester just to uh, spend a few minutes reviewing this uh, this document, so we, we we can identify anything that we may have been lax on, um, and also we can reinforce these rules with uh, with each other. So just a couple couple reminders: never use chemicals alone. Uh, only use them in designated work areas with proper ventilation. We're going to always use proper personal protective equipment, so gloves, lab coats, and respirators. So if you can smell the stuff. Um, that you're working with, that means you, you, you want to uh, take the time and wear a proper uh, respirator. If you're doing something where you're generating carbon dust with the, uh, the, the, the carbon fiber, you don't want to breathe that. So use a, a particular respirator. Um, anytime you, you can't find the PPE that you need, then come talk to me and I will, uh, I'll make sure that, we, that, 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 that I get it for you. I always use catch cans underneath or, or pouring cans, whatever, however we want, to, we want to refer to them, underneath all containers when dispensing chemicals. So again, plan that you're going to uh, leak some. So have something there to, uh, to catch it responsibly so that it's easy for you to clean up. Only leave the caps off containers long enough to uh, dispense them. No, and know in advance what to do if you do have a, a major spill. So think ahead and if you're using something you're not sure, you know, something, if, if I get a bunch of this on the floor, how am I going to clean this up? Then let's get a plan together before you, uh, you, know, you, you open that, uh, that chemical. Uh, know where the uh, nearest sink and, sink and safety shower are. The department will, will be installing a safety shower in the lab. That'll probably be, uh, obviously it'll be close to the bathroom area. That's not there yet. We talked about chemical spill responses. Uh, different ways to clean them up. Uh, first aid response, Dylan touched on. And obviously we've gone through this, uh, this document now. And we're back at our table showing the, uh, the incompatibilities. Different materials we don't want to store together. Yes. And so for this lecture, it's important that you retain all the information that you just heard. If we find that you're consistently violating some of the rules that were listed in this document, whether it's something large or something small, you may be required to, or you will be required to watch this lecture again, as well as take a, a written test. So this test may be about 30 minutes, just to confirm that you know the information that we presented. Because if you didn't catch it the first time, how will we know you didn't catch it the second? So keep that in mind that you want to avoid having to spend another two hours watching this lecture and taking this test. So do your best to uh, abide by all the points take, uh, that were noted in this document and that we have mentioned to you outside of just the points listed. And again, also make sure that anyone working in the shop, if you see them violating something, kindly tell them that you're doing this wrong, you should do this instead of what you're doing to um, prevent them from doing something wrong that may cause, that may get us a fine. So that new members or current members. Uh, in worst case scenario, uh, if it's something serious, we may limit 
any equipment or chemical usage with a member because they're consistently violating the points that have been presented to them. So with that, um, at the end of watching this document or watching this lecture, or at the end of this lecture if you attended it, uh, we're going to have a sign-up sheet for you to um, write your name down on, so we know that you have watched this le lecture in full, so we can mark you off for our shop training guide lecture. Um, are we going to be able to like access this document if we just want to look at it? Absolutely. Time? Yes. Yeah, we'll have some printed copies in the uh, shop, and we'll also have it on in the SAP section of our uh, our forum. Um, so we're we're and we're gonna we realize this is like the first time we're formally. And uh, trying to introduce such a structured uh, safety policy, so week by week, you know, we we want to have some uh, some inspections and, and an encouraging way, bring it up at our Sunday meetings, talk about okay, this week we saw you know, this this was left out or, or or we didn't do this right, so we want to we're gonna we're gonna be uh, reminding everybody, but we we, we need you to uh, you know, to if, if you're not comfortable with anything, you don't understand it, then ask us questions because this is this is vital for your safety. Obviously, I use the examples. You know, the students have gotten killed by violating some of these rules. And, and, and second, we're, you know, it's, it's vital for, uh, for our program. So we're not, we're not trying to, to catch you so we can boot you out, but we, we do need uh, everybody to, uh, to care about the, about the safety so that we can, uh, we can help each other enforce it and right. have a safe and enjoyable facility to work in. So as I stated sometime earlier in this presentation, this document will be printed out and put in the uh, binder labeled SA Shop Safety Guide, which will be located to the MSDS sheet on top of the fire cabinet. And as well as every document that we have referenced in this uh, presentation. So that's the shop safety guide, um, chemical waste management, chemical spill, personal injury, fire control, um, compressed gas cylinder usage, and any document that we may add to it. So we do have a designated safety binder for you to reference. And so I think that's it. Yeah, and we realize it's a lot. There's a lot of information here, so you know, we thank you for uh, taking your time. I know this isn't this isn't an exciting meeting. It's going two hours to talk about safety, but but it, it's a vital for everybody. You wouldn't want to see uh, if somebody care about get hurt, and obviously we don't want to see the, uh, the program get, get shut down, and we don't want us to want to be contributors to uh, hurting our environment. So, yeah, many reasons why we want to, we want to try and be uh, uh, in full compliance. Mm -hmm. Any questions? No? All right. So again, thanks. Thank you for your time. And also, uh, if I can have everyone just type their name on my computer, or actually, it's my computer.